What up, guys? Stephen Kristoff here with the Gate Drop Pod Show. This is episode nine. We interview one of the most talented people that wears, I swear, seven, eight hats here in the Northwest. He has his own graphics company. He's got his own t-shirt company. He's promoted tracks like Mountain View MX, Castle Rock, hindsight and currently is promoting riverdale raceway he also has his own podcast the tables have turned we interview justin wharton and see everything he's done and what he's got to say about it here comes episode nine the gate drop pod show starts now This is episode nine of the Gate Drop Pod Show. So Stephen Kristoff here. I am with the man, the myth, the legend. He is the person who runs JJW Designs. He owns it. He does promoting for Cas. He well, he did promoting for Castle Rock, Mountain View, and now Riverdale Winter Series. And he's also the man behind the mic on Moto Monday. It is Justin Wharton. Justin, what is going on? Oh, just hanging out, making graphics like usual. How you doing? Oh, man, it's an early morning. I know that you've probably been up since like four or five, just grinding already. Um, what is your lifestyle like doing all these kinds of things, especially your graphics? How'd you get into doing JJW stuff? Oh, well, that's been a while. Uh, making me feel old here. Uh, I started doing graphics, actually, because I started airbrushing first, like as a kid. Um, like I'm talking first year of high school, I was airbrushing helmets and I just, I don't know, I like customizing things and uh, drawing and then just, just transitioned into, well, airbrushing isn't as big of a market. It was right around when helmets actually started to look cool instead of being the cheesy old designs. And <laughs> people didn't want to spend all the money on a custom helmet when, it, you know, buy a helmet for 300 bucks and pay a thousand to paint it. It's a hard sell. So yeah. I just drifted into like, oh, graphics seems really cool and bought a little cutter in high school and just went off and I don't know, just got into it from there. Started off small and grew it and grew it. And then here we are today. Like, what is it been? Man, it's 16 years since I bought my first full graphic setup and 20 years since I started JJW. So, man, feeling old. But uh, yeah, I just started on that and built small, built in just a little bit at a time, laying the bricks. And here we are today. Yeah, I was going to say, like, it's kind of JJW is really like a to me a household name here in the northwest because like everyone who like wants graphics or stickers or anything made like you got fusion you've got jjw and i can't think of any other northwest like graphics company that has like done it for so long i know like whenever i get a brand new bike the first person i'm thinking of is justin wharton how's my graphics going by the way <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll uh, i'll get you over another mock-up on that here shortly but yeah, I've been doing it for a while. Fusion has too. Uh, I, I think I got them beat by a little bit, but I'm not exactly sure because it's, it's been a while. But and there's a few other guys who have popped in to start doing them here in the Northwest. And that's one of the fun things about the graphics industry. Is everyone's pretty laid back. Like, I'm pretty sure we all ride pit bikes. You know, we all get along. And uh, it, it's it's just a fun industry, you know? Yeah, it's such a friendly environment. Uh, with all the good that goes into making graphics and whatnot, what are the challenges you face designing and doing all of it? Challenges? Well, a lot of the challenges in making graphics is getting a ready-to-go product, honestly, because most of the equipment you find like for the sign industry doesn't exactly translate over well to motocross graphics. Our vinyl is you know, five to ten times thicker and 
we want precise colors and, and you know a lot there's a lot that goes into it that you know if you just wanted to get into making some printed signs or something you just walk into a shop by a cookie cutter combo and walk out after you swipe your credit card and you can get up and printing motocross graphics is way more that goes into it and a lot of it is like industry secret or like little things you just learn along the way so getting a high quality a uh, good color graphic at 22 mil thick is not the easiest thing in the world. So that's, that's the tough one. And then, you know, as far as designing, obviously you have to learn design like anybody who wants to, you know, for any industry that's based around printing or design is you have to learn how to be a halfway competent designer, make something look cool. And then you have to get used to, I'm probably going to send 30 to 50 proofs a day. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, the emails are out of control that uh, just how many proofs you have to do so that's a, it's a non-stop all day thing of design this move this and you know you get 10 bikes on the board like okay we got a few then you get 35 bikes on the board like all right and that's why i get up early and have my coffee and get into the shop usually before six is because there's a lot of stuff you have to get out and get approved you know for sure yeah, I've always wondered like how you guys like get that I- idea of like, hey, I want the shroud to look like this and whatnot. I know me personally with all the graphics that you've done through me through the years, I I try to make it as easy as possible and mock like the factory riders graphics like to a, to a little bit like and then just like logo modification on there. Um do you have like a graphic set that like is constantly just being used every single year that you're like, Hey, all I got to do is move logos around. Or are you pretty much having to start from scratch all the time? Um, sort of. So we have pre done kits. There are semi custom kits and that's the most popular because it's the quickest. So they're pre-designed for every bike. You can change the colors Usually it's three to four colors. You can change the colors, add your logos, but the design itself stays the same. And so with that, I just have mocked up templates and I have to just drop them in and then it's color adjusting, logos and all that. But it does make it a lot quicker. People who want full custom, we have to put in more time laying everything out and basically start from scratch drawing things. So it, it can vary, man, the amount of time you put into things. Yeah. So the semi custom is definitely the most popular because, and that you'll see almost every graphic company out there does this. It's easier and quicker to lay it all out. Start because you've already spent the time beforehand to draw everything just right. So once you put in the work, you know, ahead of time, then you release that design. It goes a lot quicker for us then to, you know, I can take that design like, okay, so this was on a YZF. Now I need to put it on a Cobra boom, there you go. It's, I mean, there's still time to it, but it's not as much as completely from scratch. Yeah. Is there like a, like place that you go to find like the cut out, cutouts for the plastics and whatnot? Cause I know like almost every single year, every bike has a different shape and size. Like how do you like form your graphics to the, the plastic styles of all these manufacturers? Well, there's two ways to do it. You can either, there are a couple companies you can go to online and you can buy templates from. Some are better than others. Some are a little thrown together sloppy and some are good. So there are a few places that do offer them or you just do it by yourself by hand, which is a very long process that involves basically, there's a couple ways to do it. Some people use like 3D scanners. Some people mock everything up with, and that like a tape or graphic material trace it or cut it and then you run it through some scanners and it's a better part of a day to get a bike dialed in just right so that's why it's nice if you do find a template that's good to go and you just stick to that template yeah now, i actually used to own the co- main company that sold templates to everybody and i sold it i sold it a few years back so huh. kind of cool to see some of my templates still floating around and stuff but it that's one of the most labor intensive parts is getting a kit to fit right. So when you find someone who put in the time, it's worth it to throw them some bucks because it takes a long time to put it together. So it actually lays out right. And there's nothing perfect though, because graphic material stretches. So I've heard some people get upset about all my kit didn't fit, but then I could go put it on. It fits just fine. That's because the material moves. 
and then you heat it up, which you should be heating your graphic cards or putting them on to help them conform. Heat yeah, them up. Tip. You can stretch <laughs> that stuff all over the place. And some people get a little too carried away. They overheat it, and then this thing just becomes a gummy mess, and who knows where it's going to end up when it's all done. <laughs> Oh, I've had my experiences of good and bad times with graphics. I'm putting them on. Um, Yeah, especially with all the bike brands and all the years that you have. I mean, KTM changes their plastics, what, every two or three years? I mean, that's got to pull your hair out at times. Like, man, I just got this template done, and then they went and changed up the design. I mean, what is your least favorite bike to make templates for? Is Is there a brand out there? All of them are getting ridiculous with their plastics now. <laughs> um, it's stuff back in like the early 2000s was nice and easy and kind of flat, but now it's just silly. Uh, I'm not a fan of the new Husky, and I'm not a fan of the whole split number plate thing. It makes numbers hard to read. It's hard to lay it out, and it's all there's it's just some funky curves on it. The previous version of the Huskies are pretty good. This The new ones, I'm not a fan. Uh, traditionally, honestly, Honda has gotten pretty bad. I would say any of the big bike Hondas are some of the worst to both make templates for and to install the graphics. Yeah, they just got funky curves and split here, tuck in there. I don't know. It's not the most fun. It is what it is. It's just not the most fun. Yeah. I always feel like Kawasaki, like depending on how you design your graphics, isn't like the shroud that goes like all the way from the top of the gas tank all the way down to the number plate, like the side shroud of it? Or yeah, we it, need to quit doing guess. that. I, I <laughs> wish I could sit down with some of these people who design the plastics and talk to them. Like, can we not design a five foot wide shroud? Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> it gets a little crazy. Uh, do you got a favorite bike that is like easy done and you can just move on with life on? <laughs> Oh, or a specific year know. of a brand. <laughs> no, well, I like most of the mini bikes are pretty good. Like the new Husky minis, like the 50, 65 and the 85. Those are all really easy and the installs go super quick. They have flat sides, uh, not too many bolt holes at all because of their clip system. So the, the Husky minis, I'd say that's my favorite. Those are easy. They still <laughs> kind of got that long number plate thing that goes, it's a number plate that actually goes all the way up the gas tank. So they got that, but it's not as big because it's a mini. So I can install a set of graphics on one of those in like 10 minutes. That's nice and easy. So installing, does that mean like if we were to pay you enough, you'd go and install our graphics here in like our garages and whatnot? Not in your garage, but I do have some (laughs) people who pay us to. They come to the shop and drop off the plastics and we will do an install. I don't enjoy it just like everybody else in the world. (laughs) And you know sometimes you have to wait a little bit until i get the time to do them but i do have some guys who just straight cannot put the graphics on so yeah they pay us to put them on a plastic you're like but hey, like buddy, said, come everyone on. in the world hates it <laughs> yeah i mean i i've gotten pretty good at doing it i've done it for a lot of my gate drop riders now where their parents or like a rider would be like dude i can't do this i i don't have the eye or time to like see like how to put it on can you do it for me and i can knock it out here and like Probably an hour is like my average on doing a full bike. I don't know what your yours is. You're probably more uh, got the pro uh, time lap times for that. <laughs> uh, it depends on the bike. There's some that I end up cussing at and taking forever on. Other ones I've busted out pretty quick. Um, I don't know what my average would be though. Got to time it. I don't know. <laughs> well, I did time a KLX 110. I pulled that off in like 12 minutes, but. Nice. Other than the rear fender, they're pretty easy. It's a lot of flat stuff. You get some of these bikes and you're just massaging it down, getting it just right forever. <laughs> so moving from graphics, you've gotten into promoting before and you still do currently. Like, How did you get into promoting race events such as Castle Rock? You did Mountain View for a couple of years and now you've been doing Riverdale rent- Winter Series for what? Is it the fourth or fifth year now? No, I don't even think it's that long. Uh, how long has it been? I think we started Three. in 17. I think we only have three seasons. Three, maybe four. I got to go back and look. I don't know. It seems blend together. Um, let's just say a few years, though. Uh, so, yeah, Riverdale. Riverdale has been a blast. So, how I got into promoting, I, I don't even remember what got into my brain that I wanted to run a race, but... I, <laughs> 
just uh, wanted to run a pit bike race and put something together and I wanted to hype it up and threw a bunch of money at it. I think I threw in like a thousand dollar pro purse and I just kind of did it. And by the end of the day, I realized I have no idea what I'm doing. So from there, just kind of hung out with, you know, other tracks, promoters, tried to pick up a few things and ran a summer series back in like 08 or something and then tried a few other just one-off events and i don't know i had fun with it so if i can have fun and make money it's usually where i go so try to do a few more a few more and yeah i've done stuff at hindsight at yeah mountain view at which man today is side note looking like a great day to ride mountain view Oh yeah, it's nice getting, and so beautiful. Here in the northwest, I, that's what I, that's what's been on my mind is like, oh, this is good weather for riding Mountain View. Uh, <laughs> and then at Riverdale, then we, oh, man, I don't know, I've, I've kind of bounced. I've done one-off events at a variety of other tracks, but I, I don't really, ha- I didn't have a plan of ever becoming a promoter, but it happened. And I put in work and I got a crew and just kind of built from there and we put on some pretty cool events. I'd like to keep putting on cool events. It just kind of just one of those evolutions, you know, never planned on getting into this to the level that I am right now, but it just happened and had fun and just learned along the way. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I never got to go out to your Castle Rock events. And then when you started doing Mountain View for what, three, I want to say three or four years, whatever that time frame was like. It got really, really big, especially with the pro purses you were throwing out. I mean, I have never seen a full gate of pros line up at Mountain View in a while. And just the, 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 what was it called? Was it the Summer Classic is how you called, is what you called it? Yeah, the Summer Classic. That was like intense because you were getting riders like Tyler Bowers out there, Ryan Brees. Like, how was that event, just the Summer Classic alone, like, How'd you feel about putting that together? What were the pros and cons of that? So that all started as an evolution from my, okay. So my Northwest mini bike national I run every year is actually the largest pit bike race in the U S as of now, I got some people gunning for me. I think I might have to step it up, but as of now it's the largest turnout of pit bike riders. So that was how I started. And I liked the atmosphere of putting on those one-off big events and throwing out some money. So then, uh, what was the year? Was it 13, I believe? Me, Steve Corey, and Bruce Barnes met, I think, at like a Buffalo Wild Wings or something like that. Or I, And just randomly, like, we should do a pro race. <laughs> and like a big pro race. And next thing you know, we put up $20,000. And we put on the Chaos of Castle Rock, which... If you want to see pros, we had 64 pros show up for that one. And Holy Western cow. Pike won. We had around multiple qualifiers, LCQ, and still had a 22-man 22 main, 22 man main event. It was insane. And pro, I, that's probably the biggest spectator event I've had, too, because we had several thousand spectators there. We almost ran out of parking. It was wild. So that one was cool. And it just – it buzz and energy you get off of that. It's addicting. It's it just – it's fun. It's fun to be involved and fun to know you put it together. Downsides, it's a royal pain in the butt to run big pro races. <laughs> <laughs> because you're going to, if you get money on the line, have way more protests. You're going to have way more people questioning flags, timing, scoring, everything. So you have to have more staff. Of course, it's more spectators. You have to have more people keep an eye on them. Sometimes you need parking attendants. Uh, of course, you have to pay for your pro purse, which is always lovely for my bank account right before the race. <laughs> uh, there's just, it's, it's as fun as it is, there's a lot of stress that goes into it. And it can be chaos if something's just slightly off. So you got to deal with that. So they're fun. They're just a lot of work. And then you also, you know, spectators, bigger event tend to get a little more rowdy, get people sneaking in booze. And, you know, I think almost every pro race I've had, I've had to remove somebody or get some authorities involved because they just, somebody got too rowdy, you know, oh, you got to deal with that. And, you know, people, they get hyped up for a big event differently than just a regular race. And sometimes some people get a little too crazy. So there's a lot that goes into trying to keep it just 
flowing smooth. So it, it's it's like fifty fifty. You get a it's a good feeling, but it's also it's a ton of work. I bet. I know like most recently I've I've started taking over like the roles of social media and a little bit of promoting here and there for Ryan and Robbie Leach at Albany and oh my gosh, the pros and cons of like trying to keep everyone happy. It, it, it's a challenge. Like we've got a lot of like laid back riders that come in. And then like most recently our two biggest races, like was the Bob and Linda Memorial race. That one brought in thousands of people. We had over 700 entries and Ryan and Robbie have not seen like that big of a turnout in probably like three years. So like when that happened, we were all overwhelmed. Like, Holy cow. Like we only had one, like, lap checker to begin with at the beginning and we had to go find a couple people and be like hey we're gonna need help because we didn't realize these gates were gonna be stacked Mm -hmm. happens it it, it happens you you plan for one size of an event and it if it's bigger you can quickly get understaffed yeah it it can can turn into chaos pretty quickly uh just trying to get keep it all together because the more people you get, the more staff you're going to need, and more you're going to have to make sure everything runs perfectly smooth. How many hours do you usually put in, like getting things prepped and then working during a day? Like, example for the Riverdale Race Series, how much time and effort does it take for you to like get a race round ready, set, and then finished? I couldn't put a number on the hours, and I probably don't want to think about it. But there is a lot that goes into it, and there's a lot of things that people wouldn't really think about that you do have to do. For example, trophies is always a big one. We have a race at Riverdale. We might get 400 entries. Well, that means one-third of those people will get trophies. So I have to go get like over 150 trophies ready, which we make those in-house. I think I'm the only promoter that does them in-house because I'm also a graphic guy. So I do those in-house. I have to make those. Then you got to make the t-shirts and the hats and all the other stuff. Then you want to make sure that you have all the different things we sell in the office, like hand warmers, ponchos, umbrellas, get those ready, make sure they're packed up. Of course, all the social media as well. And then you got to make sure that your computer is up to date and running with track side, which is always a challenge. <laughs> you and, don't say. <laughs> uh, yeah, that part is always a challenge. And then, Managing all the employees, because on the day of the event, you can have 15, 20 different people that you have to work with and make sure they show up. And there's just a lot of stuff that you don't plan for that will pop up. Like your food vendor blew out a tire on the way to the track. You still want your food vendor to be there, though. You got to figure something out. So there's a ton of that kind of stuff that goes on just the little things, and it, it saps up your time pretty quickly. There's any one thing wrong could throw all all of it off. For example, double A batteries could ruin the race because if you don't have double A batteries and your microphone goes dead, you no longer have a mic. So there's no announcing or for me for round one, or was it two? I believe it was round two this year. Your 3.5 millimeter cable gets frayed and your radio doesn't work. So we do a FM radio transmission. Yeah. So, you know, Riverdale's a very spread out parking lot. So we do a radio transmission. So where the speakers won't reach you, you can still hear what's going on. Still know when your moto is up. Well, my cable got frayed in the box and it didn't work. Oh, no. Couldn't find another one. And that means I can't connect my PA system to my radio and transmit out to the pit. So just one stupid little $5 cable can throw it all off. Yeah, that was just lots of little stuff that goes into it. You know, it's all the little things that goes into it. It sucks up your time and you just got to double, triple check everything. So I couldn't tell you the time, exact time or hours, but it's more than even I think sometimes. Yeah, I could imagine, especially just like lap counting and then posting results alone. Like we all know how much like hair gets pulled out there. Like if things are just off by just a little bit, that that rider is like, hey, I got third instead of fourth. Like, how do you deal with the challenges of like possible just like, you know, it's just like an accidental mistakes. How do you deal with riders that come up here heated about what place they got or whatever happened on the track? What how how do you uh 
fix that problem? There, well, there is no way to really fix it. You're going to have this everywhere you go. I put a lot of effort into finding ways to score as quickly and efficiently as possible. Some people may not believe me on that, but it is one of the struggles, and every track goes through it, every single track. And a lot of talk has been going on about transponders and such, and if you want to talk about that, we can talk about that later too. But (laughs) for me, let's say you have a protest. Someone thinks they finished in a different spot than what you have down. So I have a process where you have to talk to one of our office ladies, and she'll take down the info and try to figure out exactly what you're, you know, what you're saying happened, takes it then to our race marshal and if possible, some lap counters and we review sheets and I'm going to actually have video here pretty soon too. So we can review video and then just try to figure out basically if they're right or if they were wrong. Unfortunately, I would say 80 to 90% of the time wrong. I literally kept a checklist at one of my events and it was around 90% of the protests that came in were just, it was, they just just didn't catch another rider or, you know, they didn't know that person was in their class. It's stuff like that. Uh, Another problem is people swapping bikes and swapping numbers and forgetting to tell the office. That's a huge thing. At least at Riverdale, that's a huge thing. People will go out and practice, pull up their bike. They have to go park it. And all uh, they find a buddy who has a bike. They grab that bike. Okay, cool. I'm still racing. They forget there's a different number on the bike. <laughs> you oh, think it's simple, but people are in the, yeah, the heat of the moment. They're in the race day. They forget that, oh, maybe I should go tell them on a, I'm on a different number and a different bike. So, yeah, uh, with numbers and whatnot, that's got to be challenging. I know uh, lap counting without transponders. How do you feel about uh, either gray numbers on black backgrounds or uh, black numbers on gray backgrounds? <laughs> Well, I do it. I run red backgrounds with black numbers on a matte finish, and I run small numbers. Oh, so you're you're the problem. (laughs) Uh, No, uh, well, I run it also knowing that I might not get scored. I don't really care. I'm out when I go race. um, I don't want it. I don't really need the trophy. I'm just having fun. (laughs) So, (laughs) but if anyone who wants scored, run numbers that we can actually read. Just, just saying, run numbers that we can actually read. I have so many people who want those ghosted in numbers now here at JJW. They want the ghosted in numbers, which, yeah, it looks cool. It does. But if you go raise, we might have a little bit of trouble scoring you. Just saying. Yeah, I think a pro tip is uh, get like another set of plastics and then just swap them out. It's so easy to put different number plates on for like race events. And I, I do admit they do look cool. My camera, though, like, this is interesting. With my camera, as great as it is, like, those, like, ghost numbers, like, they don't show up in the photos. So, like, a lot of them, like, depending on the angle and the way the sun's hitting, like, it looks like they're just running a full black background or whatever color background. Like, it's it's so weird. Yep. And now try to have a lap counter read that when there's mud all over it, too. Oh, yeah. Do you uh, prefer... Dry conditions or wet conditions when it comes to racing? <laughs> like as me as a rider or a promoter? Uh, both. <laughs> well, as a promoter, I definitely like a nice sunny day, 75 degrees and no mud. Now, as a rider, honestly, I would say I'm like a hard pack blue groove guy. Like Mountain View is right up my alley. Oh, yeah. I don't do good in the mud. Uh, it's a different riding style. I like arena cross and outdoor hard pack. But when you get it super chopped up, like basically Grace Harbor at the end of the day, I am all over the place. There's a good chance I'm going to hit a tree. <laughs> it's no, not good. There's people who love to just hang off the back of the bike and just let it rip. I'm not that kind of guy. <laughs> so uh, oh, everyone has man. their own riding flavor. For me, yeah, I like a nice hard pack track or you know, a mild arena cross. As a promoter, whatever gets people going that want to show up. If it's raining, you're going to have to accept that it's going to take a huge cut out of your rider base. If it's 100 degrees, it's going to do the same thing. So you want it nice, sunny, 75, partially cloudy, actually. Oh, yeah. Uh, what are the positives you take away from running all these race events and whatnot? What makes you go home happy, feeling accomplished? 
feel it accomplished would be running a race that had a good turnout and it goes smoothly. Does that happen a lot? No, but <laughs> it's all of our dream because I'm doing this because I like racing motocross and I want to see stuff go well and I want to see events that come up and actually help riders so or you know, help the rider community because if you don't have events, we're going to lose our rider base quickly. People want to go do something. Just because they own a bike doesn't mean they want to practice all the time. A lot of these people want to race. So you have to provide races for them that they'll enjoy and hopefully get to fairly affordably. So I want to see some of these like random events I'll throw together. These, uh, you know, I like to do a few free riding clinics too. If I see one of those with a big turnout, that makes me happy because I feel like I'm helping riders get out there and go do stuff. So I like doing that. And honestly, just having it go smooth without any hiccups or anything breaking or the computer dying. We had that happen at Mountain View. We had our laptop fry, and we bring in the backup laptop, and it died halfway through the day. Oh, That's man. a bad day. That's called a bad day. So when everything goes smooth, people have fun, high five you, and grinning and talking about how the track was awesome. You get some satisfaction from that because you know the work you put in. So it's just like any other human. You get some satisfaction from knowing you put a lot of work into something and people enjoyed it. For sure. Is there a specific race class that you enjoy announcing or watching? That's a good question. Specific race class? I would say the women's class. And the women's class because they, they're they very polite to each other. They typically race pretty clean, but once they get into a battle, and we've seen this a bunch at Riverdale this past season because we have a few girls with the same speed. If they are the same speed and they get into a battle, it, it'll get heated. They'll start passing each other back and forth, and you'll see nine passes in a lap. And they still race fairly clean, but they their aggression level turns way up. I've seen some awesome women battles that would rival some of the pros. They just, they're going for it. And I like to see them step it up a notch and back and forth, back and forth, jumping, looking over at each other on the jump. and that's been some of my favorite. Like the fifties are fun. Like the PWs are fun too. Those PW kids are animals. Oh but, my uh, gosh. Yes, yeah, they are. <laughs> they go for it. I actually almost got ran over by one this year at Riverdale because we cut them off. So they didn't hit this big mud puddle. So we redirected the track and I'm over there holding up banners, directing traffic. And one kid was coming right at me. I was like, Hey buddy, I'm right here. Hey, Oh crap. And I had to jump out of the way because he was running me <laughs> over. I was in his way. <laughs> yeah, they don't turn that much. I gotta hand it out to those PW riders, like the Johnson family. I think his first name is Racy. I, I can't can't remember. I know it's Johnson number 930. I don't know if you saw that photo from a couple rounds ago at Riverdale where he high sided complete scorpion on the ground, everything. He's only like four, I believe. He just gets back up, and I'm like, "You all right, bud?" He's like, "Yeah, get bike started and let's go." Like, they are just <laughs> tough as nails. Yeah, they will completely flip over the bars, roll, sit there angry for a minute, and then run back to their bike. And they just keep going. I know for me and a couple of the uh, older age classes, like if we if we go down, we're probably going to be sitting there for a moment and having Liz check us out because it does kind of hurt hitting the ground. Oh, it hurts a lot. But those little PW riders are made out of rubber. They just bounce. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they just keep shredding. So I, I love watching them. And like seeing we had a kid out there on a Stasic, too. A little Stasic. And he still wanted to try to keep up with everybody else and out there motoing. So, yeah, a lot of passion in those little PW guys. Yeah, I believe that was a uh, Kev Ron's uh, little, little boy on the Stasic. And man mm -hmm. getting through those ruts especially on a winter race at riverdale with like i don't even know how big the wheel size is but like i think he disappeared in a couple ruts here and there in a couple corners uh, i wouldn't doubt it yeah wouldn't doubt it so a little bit of like your riding and racing experience are you aren't you cousins with mason wharton yes yeah i am what's that experience like with him racing supercross and whatnot like is there a thing like, how do I word it? Speed difference? Like, 
Is that what you did for racing and whatnot? Like you chased him around? Like how did you get into dirt bike racing and, and then watching him get all professional on it? Well, I'll start off by saying that I love playing the new Supercross game just so I can take him out every moto. <laughs> Mason's my younger cousin. I got a few years on him. So it was cool to see him get into it. He was a good 50 racer and he just kind of moved up through the ranks from there. But I was def- I was much older than him. And I remember the time, the first time he was actually able to beat me. And it was very annoying because... You know, I'm I'm the older cousin here, and I've been racing longer. But you know, he he took a way more serious hit. All the events for me, it's always been for fun. I've never I never thought I would have a racing career. Never attempted anything like that. So I knew he was taken way more serious, and he moved up onto a 250, and he was throwing down pretty good. Moved up to intermediate, and then I had to race him in intermediate class, and we banged bars of more than once, and went back and forth, and he got me. And it was rather annoying. It was rather annoying, but I remember, and that's been a while. But then, and then I was like, well, you're going to have to accept he's probably going to be the fast one. And from <laughs> there, sure enough, yeah. Went on to, and he raced all over, and then he went to, got his pro, I think he went to California to get his pro card. And now he spends a lot of his time down in California training. He's got a trainer down there and a place to stay. So he goes and does that. And, He's hit a few super crosses. I think he's starting to go back to the point of just, just for fun for himself too. But uh, I don't know. There, there, there was a little rivalry there for a minute because he's my little baby cousin who weighs all of a hundred pounds out on like a one twenty five and then a two fifty F. And like, no, you know, you're not going to beat me. But then I just had to accept it. Like, nah, okay, it's happening. Oh, so, yeah. he, Mason's a super cool kid. I love that guy. Yeah, uh, I mean, your guys' whole family is like raised before. I mean, you've had. You got like your other cousin, Katie Wharton, is that correct? Like before she yep. changed her name. Katie. And then you also had Jesse Wharton. Like she did the full professional women's class, and that was the thing. I've got a poster in my office right now of your cousin Jesse just ripping on the Kawasaki Motorsport Hillsboro ride. Oh, yeah. Jesse and Katie both have some racing accolades. Katie, and a lot of people don't know, actually did race pro too. She was, a lot of people remember her as Miss Arena Cross for I think three years, but uh, she actually raced WMX Pro. Jesse, Jesse just had a slight edge on her though. Jesse, man, when she gets going, she just wants to win, and uh, she's the younger of the two, and she could usually pull it out. I saw Katie and her have some pretty good battles, but. Uh, Jesse, I think, just took it one step further. And, yeah, she raced uh, pro for several years. And a lot of people have seen her at Top Gun as one of the motorsport folks. And she's, yeah, she's now just living the mom life. Doesn't have a bike. You know, actually, both of them, Katie, too. Katie just start a family. And I don't know if we're going to see her on her bike anytime soon, maybe. But right now, I think she's more focused on the family thing. Jesse... Yeah, actually, I'm supposed to have tacos with her pretty soon. I should harass her and see if she's going to get a bike soon. But because she's, you know, every once in a while she talks about still riding, but she's at that time where she's raising who knows how many kids at this point. I mean, <laughs> with, with both of them having kids now, I mean, you could always like suggest like maybe getting a PW and whatnot. So then we could just transition to the next generation there of Wharton's and. What not well for them it would be christensen and i don't know what katie katie's up to lately yeah i don't know if they i don't know if they want to do that <laughs> it's funny it's funny how many pro racers i know that have kids and aren't super hyped about throwing them on a bike i don't know why it's like you know i'm in the fight world too and you see the same thing everybody who has kids they don't really want to get them into wrestling they're like there, there's other things so i don't know i know Jesse, her kids, they got like Stasis and stuff, but I don't know if they're really planning on getting a PW. I should, I should bug her and ask her, but yeah, they, they spent many years racing. So our, I assume our name has gotten thrown around a few times. There's been a few of us Whartons in the Northwest. Oh but, yeah. I know even yeah. Curtis is ripping around most of the time. He'll come out to Albany every Wednesday and he'll be ripping one of Mason's bikes. I got to say, Curtis is still pretty quick for being an old man. Oh, yeah. He blows past me when I'm out there. <laughs> Curtis is, what is he, 50, 51 now? 
and still goes pretty darn good, stays in shape. Uh, so 40 plus and 50 plus classes got to watch out for Curtis. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. Going into all of your Moto Monday stuff, speaking of podcasts and whatnot, how did you get into being a podcaster and being one of the voices that is listened to every single week? How did I get into it was literally me and my buddy Reese just threw up a phone next to a monitor when Facebook Live like rolled out and started talking motocross. We had a ton of people watching, so then we're like, oh, maybe we should do it again. It one same thing as promoting. It just kind of started something small and rolled into something bigger, and it turned into something. So I just did episode 140. So I've done a few of them now. Yeah, you're up there. <laughs> and, yeah, I'm nothing like Joe Rogan though, man. He's like almost a 1700 now. Holy cow! <laughs> yeah, I got a ways to go. I don't know. Just, I mean, I really don't even have a game plan where I'm going to take it. I'm, I'm just letting it be organic. And I have some ideas of what I'm going to do next, but I'm just letting it be organic and see where it goes and just trying to have fun with it and keep it fun. It's been a lot of work. It's changed a lot. We started with a phone, then we switched to a few mics, then we tried two phones, and then I finally bought a mixer. The mixer didn't work very well, so then spent the money on a better mixer, and then cameras and now i have two boxes full of wires cables camera equipment and a lot of stuff i don't really know how to use but i've managed to put it together and then we got a studio with bobby p did some stuff in there i got some fun new ideas i think i'm going to be able to talk about next month i wouldn't say right now next month yeah keep it top secret kind of, <laughs> well i don't know about top secret i don't want to overcommit, but just kind of see where it goes and I'm trying to keep it organic. I've never been heavy on advertising on it, just kind of letting it go do its thing. So it's been fun. I wouldn't consider myself a professional podcaster. I just figure it out as I go, you know, and have fun with it. Yeah. I mean, especially it's so much fun listening to stories because you get big names and then you also get like unfamiliar names and that sparks the interest. And I, in my personal opinion, it helps like continue like, to keep our Northwest community together and then also grow because like you say, for example, you have like Bobby Castile on, like if people don't know who Bobby was and they're watching your podcast and they get to know him and then they see him at the track and then they may approach him and be like, Hey, like I heard you on the podcast and whatnot. And then boom, another friendship is possibly formed another riding buddy. Like it makes such a huge impact of like what your podcast has done over the last couple of years. Like, how many years have you been doing it? I want to say three years now. Yeah, because I think it just started with like the whole sitting on a Home Depot bucket to now you've got a whole studio. Like the progression has uh, definitely escalated quickly. Yeah, but well, you could say quickly. It was a lot of baby steps along the way. But it's if you look at where we started and where we are now, yeah, definitely a lot of progression. Learned a lot. I guess the whole point of the reason I'm doing the podcast is to show people stories and people who are in the industry. And you can see people at the track for years, but you still don't know too much. For example, I've known Joey Lancaster since I was in high school. I've known him forever, but him in the studio for three hours, I got to know him way better and other people did too. So we're kind of learning at the same time because rarely do you ever get a chance to sit down and just have a long form discussion with somebody at the track you're talking you're bs and you're talking about the motos or you know maybe what you want to do next week and stuff but you're not actually digging into who, who the people are so it's cool to get a little deeper in some of the stories of people that you might have seen 10 20 30 40 50 times but you don't actually know and uh, it I've seen a lot of people kind of get their eyes open like, oh, OK, well, that guy's got a story. You know, everyone's got some stories and, you know, show some angles. What's it like to be a promoter? Right. Like you're maybe what you're doing with me. I don't know. But like, what's it like being a medic? What's it like being someone who was an announcer? What's it like to, you know, at Washougal? What's it like to be Miss Arena Cross? What's it like to be a pro racer? What's it like to be a parent of a pro racer? It, 
there's a lot of fun stories you can dig into and these are all people that we see around the track so yeah opens it up you know get to know a little bit more about the people that you see for sure i mean that's kind of the reason why i've started like my podcast as well because like i wanted to kind of know like what what do people like have like what have they gone through and whatnot like trip rogers i didn't even know that he was actually a former rider he used to race dirt bikes he did flat tracking and then he got a mic put in his hand and he put the bike away same with jesse smith like everyone that i have like interviewed so far has had a dirt bike come across their life at some point like i just never thought like oh wow like there's a reason why you're doing photos or you're doing announcing or you're making graphics. Like it all like ties into the motorcycle. Yeah. And it's, that's, that's our common bond. And then you branch out from there and learn about some of the other parts, you know? So that's, that's what's fun. And I, I've thoroughly enjoyed getting to just know people's stories and just who kind of who they are and then learning about, what's it like to be in like in this area? Like I don't follow the supercross series. I mean, I watch it. I'm not there. I've been to a few, but I, but I would love to hear what is it like to be a mechanic at a supercross race in whatever, 16 rounds in a row. Like what's it like? It's interesting to hear some of that. You know, I think it's interesting. I, maybe other people disagree. I find it interesting. So it's fun to get just, yeah, just sit down, just chat with people. What um what has been the most challenging thing to run for your podcast? Is it just getting guests? Like besides like technical difficulties, like what what is like a challenge that you have to like work on all the time? Well, man, I don't know because technical difficulties, especially doing a live stream, is a big one. It's pretty big. Getting guests to show up that, you know, say they will do it and then canceling last minute is never fun. You got to deal with it. People have lives. I get it. People have things going on. But I get that a lot. People who last minute bail or you can kind of tell they got cold feet. They didn't want to be stuck on a camera live in front of people. Doing stuff live is just a bit scarier because if you say something wrong, it's kind of still out there. (laughs) So there's people in it. I've had people just straight up tell me they won't do a live one because they don't really trust that their mouths, I guess they're like, man, sometimes I just get going and who knows what I'm going to (laughs) say. So there's people who get cold feet and it's hard to get some guests that just, I think would be really cool, but they don't feel comfortable doing a live stream. So it is what it is. Um, yeah, that's a big one. That's, that's actually a pretty big one. I've had probably a third of my guests bail last minute and just weren't comfortable with it or had life happen. So oh, you just got to roll with that. That's pretty normal. I mean, it is what it is. It's not like it's a job. I mean, we're going to just podcast. So it is what it is. It's part of the gig. I talk to other podcasters and it's the same pretty much across every industry. But other than that, technical difficulties because the slightest thing can go wrong. We had an almost ruined podcast because one of my audio cables was not high grade and it touched next to a power cable and gave a nasty hiss, you know, or we had a dog when Liz Hooker came on her dog stepped on the uh surge protector and turned it off <laughs> <laughs> so you know that kind of stuff can get kind of crazy oh man i just like i got that whole image you're just in like mid moto talk and whatnot and all of a sudden just the lights everything goes dark and you're like what happened <laughs> yeah it, yeah it, it's all part of the gig though i mean i've just accepted it's all part of the gig what's your uh favorite guest been so far or do you have a couple, a handful? Man, I don't know if I have a favorite. There's a few that stand out as being pretty epic. One of the most surprising ones for me was having Donnie Proctor on. He, I, I guess I just wasn't ready. The first five minutes of the show, he told me about how he funded his racing career by being a male stripper. <laughs> I, so I wasn't really ready for a lot of that. Um, that one was one of the most fun podcasts I've ever done, especially because we've never really hung out and chatted. So everything was new to me and we had so many things to dig into. Uh, one of the worst was the one with my cousin Mason, who we were talking about. We did hot sauce and it didn't end well. 
Oh my god, I remember seeing a little video snippet of that. If you if you know the episode number by by on hand, like let me know and we can have people like go check that segment out. <laughs> oh man, I would have to go back and look. It was within it was like I want to say around 120 or something. I have to go look it up, but it was actually the after show that we do. We did a uh, hot sauce tasting and I put like eight sauces on a plate and I messed up the which one was which. So <laughs> We took one that was way too hot and we couldn't talk. We were doing a podcast. We're supposed to talk. We could not talk. It was that hot. And I, I mean, I've done some hot stuff in my life. I've done hot wing challenges. I, I enjoy a hot sauce. This was 2 million Scoville sauce and we scooped it. <laughs> and Mason looked like he was about to pass out. He was turning white. He was shaking. I got the shakes and we can't, we literally couldn't talk. The words would not come out. So I'm, I'm glad our pain caused uh, a little bit of it or, you know, helped with a little bit of entertainment for people, but it sucked. Is that one and done on the hot sauce challenge now for podcasting? No, no, no. We're going to do another one. <laughs> Maybe Just, not, I'm gonna not, give not that high. <laughs> that was not fun. I'll give it some time and we'll do another one. So we had James Hansen on and he kept us up to almost midnight. That one was pretty epic. James Hansen, who also I saw just recently retired from Rockstar. Yeah, I want to reach out to him and see what what he now plans to do on his future endeavors. Because I that came to a shock for me, seeing like stepping away from Rockstar. I'm like, whoa, what? Like, because when you see him, like you've seen him hanging out with Cooper Webb when he was a Rockstar guy, Jason Anderson. Like every time I watch Supercross, you just see James Hansen handing a hat or a Rockstar or whatever in the background. You're like, hey, I know that guy. <laughs> Yeah, you know, James James likes to do his own thing. He finds a focus and he works hard on it. Like I've known him for a long time. He never was anyone I would consider like an athlete. He he went pro and he was a good rider, but he was just a guy, you know. And now he's decided in his later 30s that he wants to become an endurance athlete. And he runs these 50 and 75 mile runs which is insane. Like a marathon is 25 miles that he's running 50, 75. You want, I think he's done some hundreds, maybe two. Jeez. Like it's crazy. His endurance level that he has built just in his thirties is absolutely impressive. I've watched cause I, I'm, I geek out on some of these crazy endurance stuff and which I absolutely cannot do. And I've watched his progression and the guy's an animal. He goes out and he just throws down and these races gonna take all day and he's just running the whole time and yeah i know he's dabbled with singing he's doubt he's dabbled with a few things oh painting you know he's done a bunch of cool moto painting and stuff he kind of just wants to go do whatever he feels led to so i would assume with him quitting rockstar husqvarna he has a, another passion maybe he wants to pursue or try some new things and it was just time so but he's been with rockstar forever like long long time he started off as one of the local little like he drove around in a van dropping off free rockstar for people and pumping up events and stuff and then he went from there worked his way up through the chain and became like the head guy for sponsoring moto athletes he's the guy you see on tv that throws a hat on the rider right before they go on the podium you know yeah and reminds them what to say so he, he went he's gone a long ways so i would imagine he's got a direction he just wants to try something different yeah, for sure. But I know we always are wanting to change Almost up. into Tuesday. What's that? Uh, he took our podcast almost into Tuesday. <laughs> we started Moto Monday that. to Moto Tuesday. <laughs> he was trying to. He's like, let's make it Moto Tuesday. I'm like, dude, we got to go. It's 1140. We got to go. He's like, no, we can hit Moto Tuesday. And now, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> All right. I have like just a few questions left because I know we've been going at it for a while and I apologize about the technical difficulties. I know when people listen, it's like, what is going on on this podcast? What is going on here? <laughs> what, oh, all good. What do you take away from every episode of Moto Monday? I take away, well, on the plus side, I usually enjoy the conversation and get to know people. So I try to, you know, I took, I stashed that away that I got to know this person a little better, got some of their context and then I'm usually hypercritical on myself because 
you know, you can say things wrong. Maybe you stutter too much, whatever. I try to address that, take down some notes, go on to the next one. It's never ending. I'm not a good speaker. I was someone who was actually born with a speech impediment and never been great at it. But uh, I figure if you work on it long enough, you get better at it. So try to take down a little notes, get better for the next one and just keep trying. And yeah, most of the time, man, when I'm done with the episode, it was like that. That was just a fun time getting to know some people and getting to know some stories. And of course, thank everybody and everyone that put it on. And if technical difficulties happen, then like, okay, let's make a shopping list to buy these things. And I'm going to throw this thing out the window and (laughs) move on. Just try to go to the next one. Oh, yeah. Just podcasting alone, like. And then all the stuff that you do with promoting and graphics, like you've got so much on your plate. I I can't even imagine doing it. And then I know like just the feeling of myself going from photographer to now promoter to writer again, like there is so much like you and I do like, it's just nuts. Yeah. It uh, definitely can get overwhelming, but just power through, just make it happen and try to keep having fun, you know? Yeah. Um, For anyone that wants to check out any of your episodes or get graphics or hit up any of your race events, like what's the best way to follow you and to see what you're up to? Well, that it's going to have to be a lot of social media plugs to cover everything. Um, But if you want to, I'll do the podcast. If you want to follow the podcast, we are actually going to be launching a new website next month. So it's going, I don't even know the URL. I'm not going to throw it out. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Boto Monday podcast. Then for my events, Riverdale MX on Instagram or Riverdale Raceway on Facebook. Then JJW Designs, pretty easy to find. Just JJW Designs on Instagram, JJWDesigns.com, JJW Designs on Facebook. Once again, fairly easy to find. Just even a Google would probably get you that. Uh, yeah, I do a lot of different things. I wear a lot of different hats. We got my clo- We got. I got three clothing companies now. So I'm. I don't have a social life. I just work, do my thing. Once in a while, I ride my pit bike. So <laughs> your and I do social a podcast life is on social Mondays. media. <laughs> my social life is non-existent. It's when I go to the track. Otherwise, I ain't got time for it because I got stuff to do. When I die, I want to feel like I did some things. So that takes a lot of hours. So, yeah, I don't really have much of a social life. But if you want to follow some of those things, I think that's where you can find some of it. And, yeah, I don't know. I think this was the first time I've been interviewed by a a different Moto podcast. So Right? The tables have turned. (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of flip-flop because I've had you on mine, and now I get to be on yours. Oh, yeah. Eventually, once I figure out this whole live streaming stuff, I'll definitely have to do more because I know we didn't even touch on your clothing line. You've got so much. I'm like, oh, my gosh, like what else to talk about? I'm like, we're already in an hour in. I'm like, you've got so much. Well, I stay busy, but um, yeah, I've had you on now. Uh, get to be on yours. Fun stuff, man. Heck, yeah. Um I think that's all I got for right now. I'll I'll let you get back to designing your graphics and whatever else you got going on on this beautiful Wednesday afternoon. I know people are going to be like, wait a second, these are pre-recorded since it gets released on Friday. But, you know, that's all I've got figured out so far. If you got any pro tips on how to get live streaming up and how to, what are your pros and cons, let me know and I will gladly take advice from you. Live streaming is a pain in the butt, but I mean, I can throw out some tips for it, but there's a reason why most people go pre-recorded because there's so much that can go wrong on a live stream. I like to do it personally because I feel like it shows that I'm being transparent because if I, if I screw up, it's still out there. You know what I mean? Like, and when I've done it hundreds of times, I've maybe said things wrong, misspelled name or mispronounced names and stuff. But for me, I like organic and proves that it is 100 organic and unedited but the flip side it's a complete pain in the butt to try to keep a good solid live stream going so i've actually done some pre-recorded ones and it does make it easier because let's say a call drops or internet goes out or anything you can just patch through it and make it happen so i try to go live stream but i've done pre-recorded it you just got to do whatever you got to do 
Yeah, I know with our podcast here, it dropped three times. I'm just like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, and if we were doing a live stream, be a little rough. Be a little rough. Exactly. Well, Justin, I appreciate you taking the time and talking about all the stuff, JJW, promoting Moto Monday. I will have you on in the future so we can dig deep in all your love for pit bike racing. I think putting you and Abrigo on the same line to go back and forth would be epic because I know you guys both have that same addiction with pit bikes. Oh, yeah. You, you make that happen. I am down. Ryan's an awesome dude. And he can shred a pit bike. He's got some number one plates to prove it. So I would have a ton of fun with it. So oh, yeah. just saying. A pit bike, pit bike podcast. That's what we'll call it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is Steven Kristoff with the Gate Drop Pod Show. We are signing out. That's a wrap for episode nine of the Gate Drop Pod Show. This is Steven Kristoff here with Gate Drop Productions. If you want to hear any of our past podcasts or check out any GoPros or solo videos, whatever Gate Drop Productions produces, make sure to hit the subscribe button here on YouTube. Follow us on Gate Drop Productions on Facebook and on Instagram at gate drop underscore pro we'll catch you guys on the next podcast